Good morning. Well, Avery, thank you so much for those uh, penetrating remarks. Uh, they're so relevant to what I want to talk to you about this morning. Um, let me say from the outset that I am not a trained historian. I'm one of those guys who, when I was in high school, like you all, the teacher asked me where was the Declaration of Independence signed, I would have said at the bottom. Um, but so I'm a newcomer to history, and it is, I can honestly tell you, my great passion and something I want to do with this last chapter in my, in my life. I want to talk about a very important and neglected, remarkably courageous group of Americans who did their thing, as it were, somewhere uh, in the 74-year period between the ratification of the Constitution in 1787 and the outbreak of the Civil War in 1861. A lot of times as historians we overlook that period, but that is the formative period in our nation's history. This is a time when America is a young republic. It's just forming its national identity. And it has this brand new ratified constitution with its wonderful preamble, we the people. It's experiencing growing pains uh, as evidenced by waves of European uh, immigration. Uh, urbanization, Western expansion. And the question comes up to the nation, and of course Philadelphia is central to this whole debate, the question comes up as to who is we the people, or who are we the people? Now the answer then was, was a simple one. We the people meant essentially, you know, white males. But there were other Americans, they may have been in a minority, who said, no, we vehemently disagree. We, the people, means all of God's children. So essentially, anybody with a belly button is part of we, the people. So you have these two ideological camps. We, the people, means no, just white males. And we, the people, means Hispanics, Native Americans, uh, blacks, women, all of God's children. And this ideological battle continued for this 74-year period and at the center of this raging debate, of course, is the issue of slavery and whether it's morally right to keep over four million men, women, and children in perpetual bondage. So slavery is the big uh, moral issue of the day. And again, we look at the two camps. One camp said, listen, slavery is expressly upheld in the Constitution itself. Are we not a nation of laws? Our constitution is the foundation, the framework for our laws, so therefore slavery is okay. Now other group of people said, no, slavery is not okay. Uh, slavery is essentially an abomination to God. The other camp says, yes, but it's an economic necessity. This is when American was a, a largely agrarian society. We need this free labor to keep the economy going. Um, so enter, if you will, two distinct groups of people, people that we call free people of color. Do you know what I mean by that? That would be black folks who essentially were never slaves or those who escaped the freedom or purchased their freedom. And high-minded um, white abolitionists who were a small but vocal minority at the time who said, listen, something else about this slavery it's in direct contradiction to our Constitution, to the fact that people are entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is the ultimate hypocrisy. So this battle goes on and on and on until, of course, it has to be settled with blood and steel with a, a bloody uh, civil war. And as we know, last year we celebrated the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. More Americans died in the Civil War than all other wars put together. Uh, historians estimate 700, over 700,000 men uh, perished in that battle. But I want to digress just for one minute to talk about why this period is so fascinating to me 
and why I think it's so powerfully relevant to what's going on today and why I wrote my book, The Reigns, Voices for American Liberty. I know some of you have read it, uh, read it last year here at Lower Marion. I want to talk about just for a minute why I wrote this book, why I think it's important, because I think my reasons for writing this book are as important or maybe even more important than the book itself. So my journey in writing this book began over 32 years ago. In 1980, when I was called back to my alma mater, Cheney University, to index and catalog a rare collection of archives. And long story short, they were renovating the main administration building had long since gone offline, so they're throwing everything out of this building, uh, furniture, every piece of paper you can imagine. And uh, in the janitor's closet was this rare collection consisting of manuscripts, correspondence, photographs, but the lion's share of the materials were scrapbooks from the period about 1850 to 1910. And they were the life's work of one man, William H. Dorsey, who was part of a small group of black bibliophiles who saw it as their mission to collect and preserve black history. So in these scrapbooks are newspaper clippings Imagine, if you will, one of us over a 50-year period cutting out of the, dutifully cutting out of the newspaper anything and everything having to do with politics, particularly politics as it related to African Americans. I mean, this was not a hobby for this guy. This is serious business. These are collectors and preservers of history. So this is what Dorsey did. So as they're renovating, beginning to renovate this building, they take all these materials and they throw them in a dumpster. Okay, so one of the janitors gets curious, yes? And he says, uh, wait a minute, this is some interesting stuff. So he tells the president of the university uh, that he thinks he has something here, and the president orders the materials brought back into the building. And I guess that's where I come in. Um, first thing we did was we had to appraise this collection, and some of you may know the name of Charles Bloxon, who's a distinguished historian in this area, particularly on the Underground Railroad. And Bloxon says to us, listen, you guys have no earthly idea what you have here. A lot of these newspaper clippings are from newspapers that are now defunct. And they're giving you a wonderful window into the world of some fascinating people. So, enter Suleiman Clark, of course, and what we have to do is, uh, uh, my have to do is essentially index and catalog all of this stuff, which took about a year, year and a half, actually. And then we, don't laugh, we microfished it. You remember microfiche, microfilm? Well, on the reel, that was, that was technology, that was where the technology was back then. But even then, I mean, we were happy that we preserved the collection, we microfilmed it, but uh, I knew then, as I knew now, that nobody's going to ride out to Cheney University and look at this material in some antiquated microfiche machine. So I saw myself in writing this book as keeping faith with what Dorsey was trying to do, and that was pass that history on to future generations. Now come to find out, William Dorsey was a member of a larger group of black bibliophiles who called themselves the American Negro Historic Society, and they formed in 1897. These are elderly men in their 80s and 90s, who had gone through slavery. They and their families had gone through slavery, and they lived to see the abolition of slavery. They were instrumental in breaking the back of slavery, and they wanted this information passed on to others. And I want to read to you a quote from the president of the organization writing in 1902 about why they're doing all this collecting. And he says, and I quote, we want the newspapers, the churches, and the parents to tell their children what our past condition was, and about those dear people who are dead and gone, of the sacrifices they made on our behalf, and the grand opportunities we are now offered. He's writing in 1902, and they're concerned that future generations may not take full advantage of the freedoms and opportunities that they had to fight so hard to get. This is what the history collecting and preservation is all about. And the dear people that they're talking about, when you read these manuscripts, 
are white abolitionists, friends of the slaves, and free people of color who literally risk life and limb to oppose slavery. Now, we have to understand that when they're doing all of this, slavery is as American as apple pie. It seemed as if the nation, meaning that many, if not most Americans, were prepared to accept slavery as a permanent, immutable fact of life. And the fact that four million people were being victimized, well, too bad, so sad. Because again, slavery is good for business. So this battle over slavery continues right up into the 1850s. And then something happens in 1850 that is a, a real game changer. You all recall, this is the year that uh, President Millet Fillmore and the United States Congress passed the Fugitive Slave Act, yes? So this is an important law because prior to 1850, if you were a good Samaritan and you wanted to help run away slaves, that was a matter of moral conscience. That was between you and God. But after 1850, the federal government said anybody aiding and abetting fugitive slaves will be thrown in jail themselves and will be fined $1,000 per slave. That's about $20,000 in today's. So not too many people had you know, $20,000 in their pocket to spare. But the government's making a strong statement. There is no more Mason-Dixon line, you know, separating the North from the South. That goes away. And all you do-gooders, all you good Samaritans who want to help slaves, we're coming after you. And you slaves, if you're south of Canada, we're coming after you. Philadelphia and the northern cities are no longer a safe haven for you. Um, this is very, very important um, because this is a time when America is forming its national identity and it is prepared to weave slavery into the very fabric of society. And there was no one to stop this runaway train because everybody, not everybody, the majority of people are drinking the same poison Kool-Aid. And add to that, you had these convoluted philosophical slash religious um, explanations for slavery that give it even more legit, quote, legitimacy. I want to read a quote from you from one of the leading uh, pastors at the time. He says in defense of slavery, Slavery is a fact. Now listen to the language. Slavery is a fact. We are not responsible for it. We are not responsible for it. The people of the South are not responsible for it. It was bought here before the Union was born. True enough. A mysterious providence. What does that mean? A mysterious providence has cast upon this continent two races distinct in origin, character, and color. Now, there's your religious argument. God himself has ordained slavery to be uh, an abolitionist and free people are going to say, no, this is an abomination to God. They couldn't be further apart on the subject. Then comes the economic defense. You know, I try to explain slavery to students in the lower grades and I try to get them to look at it this way. Imagine if you had a corporation and you had four million employees and you worked them from sun up to sun down, and you didn't have to pay them, meaning they never got to receive the fruits of their labor. Well, goodness, your profit margin is this big. I mean, your profits are going through the, through the ceiling. Slavery is business. It's good for business. And the fact that it victimizes millions of people, too bad, so sad. Now, here's a quote from one of the leading capitalists of the time, writing from New York at about, let's see, this was uh, uh, 1859. He says, now how do you like this for pure unvarnished truth? We are not such a fool as to know that slavery is a great evil, a great wrong, but a great portion of the property of the Southerners is invested upon its sanction, and the business of the North, as well as the South, has become adjusted to it. There are millions upon millions of dollars due from the Southerners to the merchants, the payment of which would be jeopardized by any rupture between the North and the South. We cannot afford to let you overthrow slavery. It is a matter of business 
necessity. So that essentially goes to the, the point that uh, you know, when we were in high school, we learned that this was largely a sectional battle between the North and the South. Not so. People in the North had vested business interests in maintaining slavery. So slavery was a nationally recognized and, and, um, and approved institution. I want to stop at this, morning, at this point and give a couple examples uh, about the bravery of these remarkable people. I talked about the Fugitive Slave Act. Um, you know, Ralph Waldo Emerson, when it first passed, he was outraged. He said this was the most detestable law ever enacted by a civilized society because it criminalizes acts of basic kindness. And the best way I know to illustrate the brave of these people is a chapter in my book about Henry Box Brown. Does anybody know about Henry Box Brown? He's finally made his way into our textbooks. I was at the uh, Underground Railroad Museum in Cincinnati not too long ago. There's an exhibit dedicated to him. But there's something wrong with the exhibit, and I'll explain. Henry Box Brown was a slave living in Richmond. And what he does is he has himself crated up in a two by four crate, yes, from Richmond going to Philadelphia. It's a 24 hour trip by train, coach, and steamer. Now everything that could go wrong with this escape plan goes wrong. Halfway between Richmond and Philadelphia, the train makes a sharp turn. You know how a crate says this side up? Well, it went upside down. So he's upside down most of this period. They gave him a drill for extra holes should he need you know, extra air. And of course the drill broke. And uh, they say by the time he got here, they thought he, all thought he was dead. Um, it was that, and he said he was so hot and sweaty, it was as if he swam to Philadelphia. Now, can we agree that Henry Box Brown did not box himself up, right? So the question is, who boxed up Henry Box Brown? Well, come to find out, it was a white guy, a white abolitionist named Stephen Smith. Okay, Stephen Smith did this in defiance of state, federal, state and federal law. Okay, so what happens from there? Stephen Smith is caught. This is all a true story. You can Google this. Stephen Smith is caught helping other slaves through the same means, boxing them up, sending them north. He's discovered. He's sentenced to seven years in prison. Yes, they even hire some inmates to stab him. He took four stab wounds to the chest and still lived to tell the story. Now, the reason why I think this is important, so illustrative the point I'm trying to make here is this. I make the case in my book that Henry Box Brown was a slave. He had you know, nothing to lose and everything to gain. Look him up, look at his, um, short book on his escape. He said he made a decision right then and there. He was either going to die in that box or have his freedom. So the reason why he's so important to African American students is a wonderful story of courage and determination. But what about Stephen Smith? And the way I'd give um, props to him, if you will, and say, look, look at this closely. Stephen Smith was a white guy who had nothing to gain and everything to lose, and he still helped them, okay? That's why I think these people are so worthy of remembrance and ethical reflection. I'll give you another example. Everyone knows Har uh, uh, Harriet Tubman, yes? The historians say, say that she helped some 300 uh, uh, escaped slaves. Well, of course, we'll never know the exact number. Why? Because everything she did, she did in slavery in defiance of the law. When she escaped herself in 1849, that was right before the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act. So for 10 years, she's an outlaw doing this business. But what I try to get young people again to see, because I, sometimes I think they don't quite grasp it, is listen you guys, Harriet Tubman didn't act alone. She didn't go around indiscriminately knocking on doors in the middle of the night saying, can you help us out? That would be suicidal, actually fatal, right? So this thing called the Underground Railroad was a loosely connected 
network, if you will, of free people of color and white abolitionists who opened up their homes, who opened up their pocketbooks to help these fugitive slaves in defiance of the law. Harriet Tubman didn't have a job. And the safe houses, they're, they're, they're here in our area, in Chester County, Delaware County, they're about 10, 15 miles apart, were all set up as safe houses run by white abolitionists and free people of color. That enabled the, the railroad to extend as far down to Georgia, right on up through, uh, through Canada. So I talk about that a lot because I think that underground model is something of a, a model for our times, if you will. It's just high-minded people of, of, of conscience coming together, everyday people trying to do the right thing. I want to conclude my remarks and talk a little about why I think this period, again, 1787 to, 19, to, eight, 1787 to 1861 is so important because I think it's so profoundly relevant to the future character and development of our country. Um, the first thing I, I would point out to you, particularly young people, is that this is an age-old battle, and Avery, Avery talked about it. It's, it's, it's raging today. This, this monumental battle between the forces of inclusion and exclusion. You had these, these patriots, these great Americans, the founding fathers, who were on one hand slaveholders, demanding rights, freedoms, privileges that they were denying to others. Okay, they were actually blind to that hypocrisy. So that battle between those two forces continues today. And second, I would say the reason why we owe this debt of gratitude to these people is that they went beyond the rhetoric of Americanism, if you will. They so deeply believed in the principles of freedom and liberty that they risked life and liberty to extend those same rights to others. To me, that's why I think they're worthy of our attention. And then thirdly, I would say these were people who had such clear vision, they could look beyond their narrow self-interest and see or believe to, to see what was for the common good, what was for the greater good of the country. And that makes them remarkable to me. Now, you know, Dr. King used to say that, that social change, responsible social change, is neither automatic or inevitable. You know, it takes conscientious people, intelligent people, to change the world. And I think he's right. And Dr. King also used to say that there are essentially two types of reality. There's descriptive reality and there's normative reality. Descriptive reality is the facts, the world just as you see them, the empirical facts. But he says also there's a normative reality. And that reality is the way the world ought to be. And that if we're going to be responsible citizens in this democracy, we have to maintain some sense of oughtness about the future of our, company, of our country. So let me just say this. I think this history is important. I think it's relevant today as we continue this battle about the 1% and the 99% uh, as business interests um, threaten our democracy so, so acutely. I mean, we've got to be aware. We've got to, we've got to think clearly and think deeply about where we want this country to be the kind of country you want to be bequeathed to, to our children. And if nothing else, I think this history gives us just cause to be humble, yes, and hopeful about the future of this great country. Thank you all.